Medical Sign, Wikipedia Article Audio A medical sign is an objective indication of some medical fact or characteristic that may be detected by a patient or anyone, especially a physician, before or during a physical examination of a patient. For example, whereas a tingling paresthesia is a symptom, erythema is a sign. Symptoms and signs are often nonspecific, but often combinations of them are at least suggestive of certain diagnoses, helping to narrow down what may be wrong. In other cases they are specific even to the point of being pathognomonic. Semiotics Versus Symptoms Types Technological development creating signs detectable only by physicians. Advances in the 19th century. Alteration of the relationship between physician and patient. As tests. Examples of signs. Some signs may have no meaning to the patient, and may even go unnoticed but may be meaningful and significant to the healthcare provider in assisting diagnosis. Examples of signs include elevated blood pressure, a clubbing of the ends of fingers, a staggering gait and arcus senilis of the eyes. The term sign is not to be confused with the term indication, which in medicine denotes a valid reason for using some treatment. The art of interpreting clinical signs was originally called semiotics in English. This term, then written semiotics, was first used in English in 1670 by Henry Stubbs, to denote the branch of medical science relating to the interpretation of signs. Signs are different from symptoms, the subjective experiences, such as fatigue that patients might report to their examining physician. For convenience, signs are commonly distinguished from symptoms as follows, both are something abnormal, relevant to a potential medical condition, but a symptom is experienced and reported by the patient, while a sign is discovered by the physician during examination or by a clinical scientist by means of an in vivo examination of the patient. 75. A slightly different definition views signs as any indication of a medical condition that can be objectively observed, whereas a symptom is merely any manifestation of a condition that is apparent to the patient. From this definition, it can be said that an asymptomatic patient is uninhibited by disease. However, a doctor may discover the sign hypertension in an asymptomatic patient, who does not experience disease, and the sign indicates a disease state that poses a hazard to the patient. With this set of definitions, there is some overlap certain things may qualify as both a sign and a symptom. Lester S. King, author of Medical Thinking argues that an essential feature of a sign is that there is both a sign and a thing signified. And, because the essence of a sign is to convey information, it can only be a sign, properly speaking, if it has meaning. Therefore, a sign ceases to be a sign when you cannot read it. 7374 A person who has and exercises the knowledge required to understand the significance or indication or meaning of the sign, is necessary for something to be a complete sign. A physical phenomenon that is not actually interpreted as a sign pointing to something else is, in medicine, merely a symptom. Thus, King rejects these present-day views, however widely accepted, as quite faulty at variance not only with ordinary usage but with the entire history of medicine. 77. Symptom is a phenomenon, caused by an illness and observable directly in experience. We may speak of it as a manifestation of illness. When the observer reflects on that phenomenon and uses it as a base for further inferences, 
then that symptom is transformed into a sign. As a sign it points beyond itself perhaps to the present illness, or to the past or to the future. That to which a sign points is part of its meaning, which may be rich and complex, or scanty, or any gradation in between. In medicine, then, a sign is thus a phenomenon from which we may get a message, a message that tells us something about the patient or the disease. A phenomenon or observation that does not convey a message is not a sign. The distinction between signs and symptom rests on the meaning, and this is not perceived but inferred. 81. Medical signs may be classified by the type of inference that may be made from their presence, for example. Appearance may be described thus, the nose sharp, the eyes sunken the temples fallen in, the ears cold and drawn in and their lobes distorted, the skin of the face hard, stretched and dry, and the color of the face pale or dusky. And if there is no improvement within, it must be realized that this sign portends death. Symptoms become signs when they permit inference. Ordinarily, one single symptom by itself such as pain or swelling, or discoloration, or bloody discharge would not permit any specific inference, but when symptoms occur in clusters and form a pattern, then the aggregate might point to a particular disease. The pathognomonic sign, however, does not need any other manifestation to lead the physician to the correct diagnosis. It constitutes a one-to-one -one relationship the sign and the disease are uniquely related. The pathognomonic sign was the clincher, the datum that established the diagnosis unequivocally. 100. Prior to the 19th century there was little difference in the powers of observation between physician and patient. Most medical practice was conducted as a joint cooperative interaction between the physician and his aristocratic patient as equals. This was gradually replaced by a monolithic consensus of opinion imposed from within the community of medical investigators. Whilst each noticed much the same things, the physician had a more informed interpretation of those things, the physicians knew what the findings meant and the layman did not. 82. However, the patient was gradually removed from the medical interaction due to significant technological advances such as the introduction of the techniques of percussion and auscultation into medical practice altered the relationship between physician and patient in a very significant way, specifically because these techniques relied almost entirely upon the physician listening to the sounds of the patient's body. Not only did this development greatly reduce the patient's capacity to observe and contribute to the process of diagnosis, it also meant that the patient was often instructed to stop talking, and remain silent. As these sorts of evolutionary changes continued to take place in medical practice, it was increasingly necessary to uniquely identify data that was accessible only to the physician and to be able to differentiate those observations from others that were also available to the patient, and it just seemed natural to use signs for the class of physician-specific data, and symptoms for the class of observations available to the patient. King proposes a more advanced notion, namely, that a sign is something that has meaning, regardless of whether it is observed by the physician or reported by the patient. The belief that a symptom is a subjective report of the patient, while a sign is something that the physician elicits, is a 20th century product that contravenes the usage of 2000 years of medicine. In practice, now as always, the physician makes his judgments from the information that he gathers. The modern usage of signs and symptoms emphasizes merely the source of the information, which is not really too important. Far more important is the use that the information serves. If the data, however derived, 
lead to some inferences and go beyond themselves, those data are signs. If, however, the data remain as mere observations without interpretation, they are symptoms, regardless of their source. Symptoms become signs when they lead to an interpretation. The distinction between information and inference underlies all medical thinking and should be preserved. 89. In some senses, the process of diagnosis is always a matter of assessing the likelihood that a given condition is present in the patient. In a patient who presents with hemoptysis, the hemoptysis is very much more likely to be caused by respiratory disease than by the patient having broken their toe. Each question in the history taking allows the medical practitioner to narrow down their view of the cause of the symptom, testing, and building up their hypotheses as they go along. Examination, which is essentially looking for clinical signs, allows the medical practitioner to see if there is evidence in the patient's body to support their hypotheses about the disease that might be present. A patient who has given a good story to support a diagnosis of tuberculosis might be found, on examination, to show signs that lead the practitioner away from that diagnosis and more towards sarcoidosis, for example. Examination for signs tests the practitioner's hypotheses, and each time a sign is found that supports a given diagnosis, that diagnosis becomes more likely. Special tests also allow a hypothesis to be tested. These special tests are also said to show signs in a clinical sense. Again, a test can be considered pathonomic for a given disease, but in that case the test is generally said to be diagnostic of that disease rather than pathonomic. An example would be a history of a fall from a height, followed by a lot of pain in the leg. The signs are only very strongly suggestive of a fracture, it might not actually be broken, and even if it is, the particular kind of fracture and its degree of dislocation need to be known, so the practitioner orders an X-ray and, for example, if the X-ray were to show a fractured tibia, the film would be diagnostic of the fracture. Medical Sign, Symptom, Syndrome Medical diagnosis, differential diagnosis, prognosis. Acute, chronic, cure slash remission. Disease, eponymous disease, acronym or abbreviation. Prognostic signs, signs that indicate the outcome of the current bodily state of the patient. 80. Prognostic signs always point to the future. Perhaps the most famous prognostic sign is the facies Hippocratica. The 1808 introduction of the percussion technique, the process through which the physician can assess the state of the underlying lung by sensing the character of vibrations by gentle taps on the chest wall greatly facilitated the diagnosis of pneumonia and other respiratory diseases. The techniques which had been first described by the Viennese physician Leopold Einbrugger in 1761, became far more widely known following the publication of Jean Nicolas Corvisart's translation of O. N. Brugger's work in 1808, the 1819 introduction by René Lenach of the technique of auscultation. Lenach's publication was translated into English. 1821-1834, by John Forbes, the 1846 introduction by surgeon John Hutchinson of the spirometer, an apparatus for assessing the mechanical properties of the lungs via measurements of forced exhalation and forced inhalation. And obstructive diseases, the 1851 invention by Hermann von Helmholtz of the ophthalmoscope which allowed physicians to examine the inside of the human eye, the immediate widespread clinical use of Sir Thomas Clifford Allbutt's 6-inch pocket clinical thermometer, 
which he had devised in 1867, the 1882 Introduction of Bacterian Cultures by Robert Cook, initially for the tuberculosis, being the first laboratory test to confirm bacterial infections, the 1895 clinical use of X-rays which began. Almost immediately after they had been discovered that year by Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen, the 1896 introduction of the sphygmomanometer, designed by Scipione Riverocci, to measure blood pressure. 